So I get the privilege to introduce our speaker this morning, and um, it's actually a really awesome way that, that God brought, do you go by Kim or Kimberly? Okay, Kim or Kimberly, I'm going to call her Kimberly, because that's what I've been calling her in my head, so it's going to make most sense. Broad, um, Ashley and I spend a lot of months planning for Ripples, and um, we always ask the staff, like, do you have any suggestions within our church body or outside of our church body? And one of the staff members had recently met Kimberly. Um, they are fairly newer to Whitestone, and um, thought she would be a perfect fit. And from the moment we reached out, kind of have goosebumps because she's exactly what we want. So I'm so excited to, um, to introduce Kimberly. She's a, a new uh, part of our Whitestone family. And bear with me, sorry, I did switch from Apple to Android in the last week. So this mom is struggling. <laughs> and don't ask me why I did it, because... All right, so Kimberly has faithfully been serving in the women's ministry for over 20 years, most recently as the Director of Biblical Teaching at Harvest Bible Chapel in Chicago. Prior to her time in ministry, she worked in the marketplace as a professional corporate trainer, serving Fortune 500 companies in leadership development. Kimberly earned her master's degree in Christian studies from Grand Canyon University in 2017 and is dedicated to using her corporate skills along with her theological training to advance church leadership and discipleship. Kimberly enjoys lake life in her free time, and she simply loves Jesus. She has been married for 23 years to the love of her life, Carl, and they both cherish family time with their three young adult children. Charlie, a senior at Liberty University, Ashley, a sophomore at Baylor University, and Blake, a senior at Lake Country Lutheran High School. So we look forward to getting to know Kimberly a little bit more. We're just going to open um, in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the sun shining, the cooler temperatures. I'm thankful that the parking lot here at Whitestone is, as, is in as good of shape as it is so that we could all attend and be here together, Lord. I thank you um, for our speaker, Kimberly. I praise you for how you brought her to Ripple Effect. And I, we just look forward, Lord, to what you have her um, have laid on her heart to share, Lord. We just ask you to bless her to help her be your vessel, and I just ask for the rest of us to quiet our, mi our minds and our hearts and just open our minds and our hearts, just quiet everything else so that we can fully um, hear from you, Lord. We just ask all this in your precious name. Amen. All right, I'm going to grab you a seat. Good morning, everyone. I put my blingy boots on, but I needed higher ones or I needed to be taller. I feel a little short here, but that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll get that going. Let's set up. Thank you so much. I'll probably be walking around. I'm that kind of person, but you never know. I might want to sit as well. How's everyone this morning? Good? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, two questions this morning, ladies. One, who am I? Two, who was I created to be? And these are the two most asked questions out there. Did you know that? Many of you remember this book. We'll show it up on the slide. How many of you remember that? The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. Did you know that it sold over 50 million copies since, I think it was uh, published in 2002, I'm going to turn this off for a second. Um, it was written in more than 85 different languages, and it was on the New York Times bestseller list for over 90 weeks. It is one of the best-selling book ever out there, of course, next to the Bible, right? So why? Why this book? Well, people are desperately seeking answers to those two very questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And I have to confess that I too struggled with those questions growing up. Probably the first 30 years of my life, I did not have a clear direction or a clear path of what my purpose was going to be. I was defining my purpose by worldly standards, even though I was a Christian. 
I, I decided that my purpose was, oh, it's, it's probably my skill set. Or, no, my purpose was my job. And for many years, my purpose was a role being a mom. And yes, these were all very good and proper elements of, what my, of who I am in life. But the Lord, however, defines purpose in very, very different terms. So as I was busy making plans for myself, my worth, As I was navigating how to make my mark on society, I read Proverbs 2.13. Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. I didn't know the Lord's purpose for my life at that time. I was building my house on a pile of sand. I was creating my own purpose for my own glory and my own joy. But God, those two words, if you are a Christian today, you can easily say, I was this person full of sin, but God got a hold of my life, and now I am a new creation in him. And when I decided to make Jesus not only my savior, but the Lord of my life, one whom I'm to obey, that is when I got to get into this word. I got into his word. And I got to learn about his ways and what a great and merciful God he is. He is a God who clearly reveals his purpose for each of us. So today I want to share with you what I know now about living with purpose. Because there is a purpose for which God has always planned for his children. Because when you have purpose, you have passion And when you have passion, joy abounds in every season. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this room. We ask that you soften our hearts so that we can be transformed and that you open our ears so that we can hear what you have to say to us today. We desire to live a purposeful life, one that honors you, one that glorifies your name. May every word that come out of my mouth today be from you. And we ask this all in the precious and the most holy name of Jesus. Amen. Ladies, spoiler alert. God has a purpose for our lives and he has revealed it. And that's what we're going to be learning today. This is not some big mystery that we need to unfold or flush out, even though many of us may think that it is. So for some of us, you may be hearing this for the very first time. And praise the Lord, I wish I had heard this 30 years ago. But for others, you just might need to be a little reminded on how to live more intentionally with God's revealed purpose for your life. So let's begin by looking at a woman who actually lives on mission or a woman who has purpose in honoring the Lord. What does she look like? Well, her love is genuine. She abhors evil. She holds on to what is good. She rejoices in hope. She's very patient in difficult times. She's constant in prayer and she leaves all revenge to the Lord. She has a very simplified life because her eyes are on Jesus. She has very little stress because she trusts the Lord. She has increased satisfaction because the Lord blesses her through her obedience. Her purpose drives her, her purpose focuses her, and her purpose motivates her in life. But the beautiful thing is this, it's not done by her efforts. It's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you live on purpose for the Lord, he gives great joy. Your theme verse for this year is finding joy in every season. So today you can begin experiencing that joy by living out God's purpose for your life. So first I want to ask you, do you desire to live a life of purpose? How many do? You got to have that fire in your belly. You have to have the desire to want it. If you're shaking your head yes, which a lot of you did, and you raised your hands, you're in the right place today. 
So let's begin to unpack those two questions that we started out with. Because these two questions are what happen to be the framework for building a solid foundation for a purpose-propelled life. Who am I? And why or for what purpose was I created? When we know the answer to these two questions, our life automatically begins to form purpose. And so we're all on the same page. Let's define what purpose is. Purpose is the reason for which something or someone is created or the reason for which something exists. So let's look at who exactly am I? Now, in the most basic form, and at least as simply as I could make it, you are created by God, created for God, and you're created with eternity set in your hearts. By God, for God, with eternity set in your hearts. Now, we're going to take each one of those little prepositional phrases and flush those out this morning. So let's start out with, you were created by God. And in order to understand who we are, first we need to know who our creator is. Psalm 139, David says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Ladies, I don't care how you got here, how you got into this world. Some of you got here through natural birth. Some of you were adopted. Some of you um, may have been illegitimate by birth. It doesn't matter. God knew you, and God created you to be here for this time. Some of you may need to hear that this morning. Some of you also might need to hear that you were made exactly as God chose you. He made you just the way he wanted to make you. And God made a beautiful variegated landscape of women. Some of us are tall, some are short, some have blonde hair, dark hair, blue eyes, green eyes, uh, curly hair, all the different skin. We have white, black, tan. Ladies, we are, this is election year, we are one race. Do not let Satan get into us, divide into divisions, saying, oh, well, you're this color and you're this color. We are one race, the human race, amen? amen? But God made a kaleidoscope of colors, and it's a beautiful thing. But no matter how God designed us on the outside, true beauty is on the inside in God's eyes. It's the posture of our heart. He looks at your compassion. He looks at you loving him and loving others well. So this morning, I'm going to give you a couple of nuggets to chew on for the rest of the week and beyond. And here's nugget number one. God created you. You don't need to recreate yourself. Phew, that's one thing off of your to-do list, right? Uh, live, the skin, live in the skin that you're in. You know, I have two boys and one girl, as you just heard. And gosh, I had to repeat that over and over and over. God made you unique. You need to be who you are, not who someone tells you how you need to be. God designed us perfectly in his image. And that's the person that you must give to the world. However, we live in a world that bombards us with images of what we should look like, what we need to wear. Oh my goodness, ladies, social media, it's a comparison trap. I look on Facebook and I get you know, sucked into it. I look at all my friends that I haven't seen for 20 years, and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're traveling the world. Oh, their family is perfect. Oh, their marriage looks so good. It's a comparison trap. And for kids these days, their worth is based on how many thumbs up they get. It's sad. And the images that pop up on social media, oh my gosh, my eyes should be scarred. What people are wearing or lack of, right? So I challenge you, instead of turning to this in your free time, pick up this. You can pick up this if you open the Bible app, <laughs> okay? <laughs> uh, but the Bible, it's profitable for teaching like we're doing here today. It's good for reproof and for correction and for training and righteousness. You know, Satan is the king of this world. 
but not for long. And he'll do everything in his power to bring you down. I got an email, oh, a while back, and I just thought this was such a good reminder. Um, if we can put it up on the screen. It says, if life has broken you down, remember what God says about you. You are valuable. You are worthy of love. You are enough. Your life has purpose. You are wonderfully made. You are chosen, blessed, and forgiven. We need to put that track on our minds each and every day, dear Lord. But we have a God who has overcome the world, right? And we as women, yes, we are a work in progress, and hopefully we're becoming more and more like an image of Jesus Christ each day. But I hope you can say like David did in Psalm 139, I praise you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. God desires for you to know that your soul is beautiful. Do you know that? Can you feel that? Can you declare that like David did? Because made by a powerful, gracious, loving God, we need to accept who God created us to be. We need to know our strengths and our weaknesses, but know that you're his masterpiece. Don't waste time in recreating someone that you're not, amen? So we're made by God. Let's move on to we were made for God. Now, this is very difficult for me. It's not about us, ladies. Our purpose is not our own. As much as we would like to dictate what we want to do, who we want to be, where we want to live and work and play, it's not about our desires. It's knowing instead that we were created for his pleasure. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Isn't it comforting knowing that a loving God simply created us because he loves us? He wants to be in community with us. So here's nugget number two. Everything in life is for God. It's not for ourselves. Matthew 16 and Mark 8 say, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And if we are to do that, if we are called by God, then we need to know his commands for us. And once we know that, then we need to live a life of obedience to glorify him. With every thought we have, with every word we speak, and with every deed that we do. This is intentional living at its peak. We cannot walk around this life aiming at nothing. You know, Zig Ziglar, way back, um, he's a motivational speaker, he said a quote, if you aim at nothing, it is guaranteed you will hit it every single time. And Acts 20, 24 says, but I do not account my life of any value nor precious to myself. If only I may finish the course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So how do you live for God? You testify. You give your testimony, ladies. I was but God, and now I am. Give him your first fruits, your time, your treasures, your talents, along with your testimony. And in response, do it for God's grace. He's so gracious to us, is he not? We were made by God, and we were created to live for God. And then here's the amazing thing. God made us so different than anything else that he created in this world. Different from the animals, different from nature, different from everything. Because he set eternity on man and woman's heart. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has put eternity into our heart. You know, the older I get, even though I feel like I'm 18 on the inside, the outside is fleeting away. <laughs> 
But that's what life is. Today is but a flash in the pan. The Bible says it's but a vapor. And eternity is growing one step closer each and every day for each one of us. And Psalm 90, 12 says, teach us to number our days. I used to get depressed when I read that. I'm like, oh, why are we doing this? But here, this is why. It's that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It's directly from the Bible. Gaining godly wisdom in this life is living a life of purpose. And if you want a fire hose of wisdom, look in any of the wisdom books. Uh, Song of Songs, Job, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, but of course, Proverbs. We all know Proverbs, right? There's over 800 different wisdom nuggets that you can get in that book alone. But if you want to learn the overarching theme of wisdom, here's nugget number three. Focus on eternity, not this present life. Sure, we have to learn how to live in the day-to-day. However, our focus should always be looking forward. Set your mind on things above. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Ladies, things depreciate you. Buy a brand new car, you drive it off the lot, it depreciates 25%. How many of us have kids being in a mom's group? (laughs) All of you guys should be raising your hands. Things get stained, right? Things get broken. Things get lost. It's all fleeting. Colossians 3, 1, 2 says, Then you have, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So what does that practically look like? Well, you're putting to death on earthly things. That's what it says. It says, loosen your grip. Nothing is yours. Maybe be more generous. Maybe not hoard. Maybe not hold on to things so tightly that that's your idol. Loosen your grip. Maybe you need to put on your new nature in Christ a little bit more. What does that look like? You love more. Quit fighting. Quit bickering. Quit being right. Just love others. Worry less. Anxiety is at a peak in our day and age. We worry about things that are happening, things that aren't happening, things that could happen. You name it, we worry about it. Kids are being debilitated because they have so much worry in them. Give it to the Lord. He's the one. He's the keeper of you. He loves you. He protects you. Give it up to him. And just do good. The Lord gave us a conscience. We know what right and wrong is, whether we're a Christian or not. Do good to others. Do good to yourself. Do good to the Lord. And practically speaking, keeping our minds on things above, that means we're repenting a lot, ladies. We're seeing how sinful we are in our thoughts and our words and our deeds. But we have a loving God who has erased all of our sins but we are to repent of them to him. We are to forgive. I hope there isn't a woman in this room who has not forgiven anyone who has wronged them because we have a God who paid the ultimate price to forgive us of our sins. And also we need to entrust And trust in the Lord that he has our best interest in mind and we need to rejoice in that. That's setting your mind on things above. And to help us do that, what? We're in God's word. God's word is beautiful. I love this book. I love, love, love it. God's word unveils the mind of God. It reveals the will of God. It shows us the work of God and it constantly calls the reader to faith in a loving God. So moms and grandmas, we were created by God, for God, 
And he set eternity on our hearts. Now and only now do we have a solid foundation upon which to live a purposeful life. So here's where we move on to the second question. Why was I created? And I'm glad you asked because the Bible tells us why. (laughs) If you have professed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved says Romans 10, 9. And as a saved believer, you are called to do the will of God. And without going into too much theological jargon, it's important to know that two wills are actually happening at the same time. We have God's sovereign will, or sometimes it's called the will of decree. We also have God's will of command, or what he commands us to do. So in a nutshell, God's sovereign will, just to understand that, um, it's God is God and we are not. And that's that. The almighty God breathes out in Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. Drop the mic, right? He'll make happen what he desires, even though it may be hard to grasp at times that a good God allows hurt, pain, suffering, discomfort, affliction, and struggles. How many of you have been in a valley? I know I have been in valleys, (laughs) but I also know that that is the closest time I have been with the Lord because that is where I have, I have nothing to give. I have nothing to hold on to. The only person I hold on to is Jesus Christ. And guess what? He got me out of each of those valleys. Sometimes it's a short time. Sometimes it's an ongoing time for a long, long time. But he brings you out of that valley. Because know this, he is working out all things for his good, for those who love him. He's a loving God and he's a just God. He will right every wrong in his own timing and his perfect timing. Our God is sovereign, meaning he is the ultimate authority and power to rule over all things. And it is his will, it is his will to do so. This is God's sovereign will. The second will, the will of command, what he commands us to do. These are the tangible things that the Lord wills us to do as believers. And these are the things that make up the purpose of our life. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and we can read it on the screen, this is the will of God, your, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, sanctification is a churchy word. In Greek, it's called hagios, which basically means the likeness of nature with the Lord. The likeness of nature with the Lord. So as we're growing in our sanctification, we become more and more like Christ. So what's the will of God? To be more like him. Here's nugget number four. We need to grow in Christ-likeness. The world tells us our purpose is to get more, to buy more, to strive for more. However, God tells us our purpose is to love him more, seek him more, ask him more questions, be with him more. And when you do that, you become more and more like our God. Worldly purpose seeks out outward achievements, wealth, fame, things, God's purpose for us is to change our character and to change our heart posture. Growing in Christ-likeness is displaying the attributes of God. We're more humble. We're more pure. We're righteous. We're just. We're blameless. We're upright. And we're virtuous. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This is how you renew your mind. That by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
You know, transformation happens when we obey the will of God. And to know the will of God is to know him. And when we seek him in his ways, we have a growing desire to love both him and to love others well. The Pharisees asked, oh, well, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And in Matthew 22, he says, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Growing in Christ-likeness means loving God and loving others well. Ladies, this is our purpose. Moms and grandmas, if you want a sobering exercise to see how well you're living this out, why don't we pull out our calendars? Pull them up on your phone if you, if you have a calendar on your phone. If you don't have your calendar here, if it's at home, my mom writes every single date out. You can do this exercise later. But just take a look at your calendar for the last week. Look at what's on it. How much of your time on your calendar is devoted to God? How much is devoted to loving others? How much time do you have scheduled in for the things of the world versus doing kingdom impact work? Wow, when I did this, I was astonished to see a majority, I mean, I'm talking 90% of my calendar, was worldly and me-focused. Now, this is not meant to condemn whatsoever. This is just meant to open our eyes so we can be transformed. Ladies, yes, we live in the world with jobs and appointments. We get that. We have to live in the world, right? Right? But are we leaving room for God? Are we creating space for the Holy Spirit to move? Are we scheduling time for spiritual disciplines? Are we scheduling time to be in solitude and silence with the Lord? For me, that's really difficult. I love to talk. I love to be in community. So to be alone for a half hour, just with no agenda, just Lord speak to me, so difficult. But if you can do that, Whoa, will you be blessed. He will put people on your mind. He will put things that you need to do on your mind. And all these things are to serve him. Do you put meditation and worship on your calendar? What about fasting or confession? What about study and prayer? These are the fruitful activities to put on your calendar each week. I don't know why, why we don't do it. We always put our you know, appointments on there, but why don't we schedule in this hour? I'm going to be in prayer. This 10 minutes, I'm going to be in prayer. Where Start slow and then build up. But put it in your calendar and do these things. Because when we do that, we shine the light of Christ more brightly. We display attributes of God when we're more like him. Him. And as we live for Christ, we must live out 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. This is actually hanging on my wall in, in my um, house. We have the next slide. Many of you know this. It's pretty self-explanatory. Rejoice always. Have that joy in your heart, ladies. Pray without ceasing. Be in constant communion with the Lord. Give thanks in all circumstances, knowing if you are in a valley, he will get you out of it. And it is a sweet time if you seek him in that valley. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And why, why be obedient to his will? Because we want to glorify him. That's nugget number five. Glorify God in everything. We give praise to the one who deserves it. We lift his name high above everything else. And we give worship to the creator God, to the savior Jesus, and to the Holy Spirit who lives and works within us. So in closing, ladies, don't mistake your purpose like I did for a title, for a role. That's not your purpose but know, know rather that they are a means 
to live out your purpose? Do they see God in you, in your job, in your role as a mother, in your role as a grandmother? Now, this series is all about joy. It's kara in Greek, meaning to rejoice because of grace. And when you have joy in living out the Lord's will, your life is a fragrant offering to the Lord. It's a pleasing aroma to him. God's purpose for us is good. He desires to bless us when we are obedient to all of his ways. Let us be obedient to the one who created us. Now on your table, you'll see some bracelets around the flowers. You can grab one of those, pick out whatever color you want or trade with another table. But if you feel like it, wear it this week and maybe beyond and use it as a reminder why you were created. You were created by God, for God, with eternity in your hearts. Or maybe it's just to spur you on to live a more sanctified life, to be more like Jesus, and let it remind you to give him all the glory and the honor and the praise. I want to leave you with Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, which says this. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, You're a good God, and we love you dearly. We thank you for this time to get together as women, as moms, as grandmas, desiring to know your purpose for us. Sometimes we make it just more difficult than it is when all you simply call us to do is to love you and love those around us, to continually grow in our own sanctification and do it for your glory, and also to spread the good news to a hurting world, the news of Jesus. We also thank you for making it clear to us today that we were created by you as a masterpiece. We are your workmanship. We're created for your good pleasure. And please, dear Lord, keep our hearts and minds and actions focused on what's truly important, living for you in light of eternity. Lord, go before each of these women here today Make their purposes abundantly clear to them and honorable to you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.